Story 4, Part 3, 5. The holy elder Philemon kept the following monastic rule. At night, he slowly and patiently chanted the entire Psalter and all the canticles, the nine included in the Psalter, and then read the beginning of one of the Gospels. Then he sat down, and for a considerable time, with total concentration, he silently repeated, Lord, have mercy. When he could no longer recite these words, he allowed himself to take a nap. At dawn, he chanted the first hour, after which he sat facing the east and took turns chanting the psalms and reading his own selections from the epistles and the gospels. Thus, he spent the entire day constantly psalmodizing, praying, and delighting in divine contemplation. Often his intellect was so caught up in contemplative ecstasy that he knew not whether he was in heaven or on earth. 6. Seeing how earnestly he prayed and kept the monastic rule, and how sometimes his countenance completely changed while he was immersed in mystical contemplation, a brother once asked him, Father, is it not difficult for you at your old age to mortify and to exert your body so much? He replied, Believe me, God has instilled such zeal and such love for prayer in my soul that I don't even have the strength to satisfy fully its longings. Love of God and hope for future blessings overcome physical weakness. Thus, his intense longing transported his intellect up to heaven, and this happened even during meals, not only at other times. 7. A certain brother who lived with him once asked Philemon, what kind of mysteries does mystical contemplation reveal? Seeing his persistence and that he sincerely sought guidance, Philemon replied, I tell you, my child, that to him who has completely purified his mind, God grants visions of the powers and the ranks of angels who serve him. 8. The same brother then asked him, Why is it, Father, that you take greater delight in the Psalter than in any other book of Holy Scripture? And why is it that when you are quietly chanting, it looks like you are, I can't tear myself away from delighting in all the mystical revelations that are hidden in them, for they embrace the entire Holy Scripture. 9. A certain brother named John, who had traveled from the coast, came to see this great and holy father, Philemon. He embraced his feet and said to him, What shall I do, father, to save myself? For my mind wanders and drifts everywhere it should not. After a moment of silence, Philemon said, This spiritual sickness occurs in people who are focused on the external, and it afflicts them. You have this sickness, and that is why you have not yet acquired a perfect love of God. You don't yet have an intimate love for and knowledge of Him. The brother said, Then what should I do, Father? Philemon replied, Go and acquire the hidden secret knowledge of the heart, and it will purify your mind of this sickness. The brother did not know what the elder was talking about and asked him, Father, what is this secret knowledge? And he replied, Go and practice watchfulness in your heart, and with attention, fear, and trepidation, recite, Lord, Christ, have mercy on me. This is what the blessed Diadochus teaches beginners to do. 10. The brother left, and with God's help, through the prayers of the elder, he found peace and some delight from doing what he had been taught, but then the delight left him, and he could no longer practice watchfulness and pray. So he went again to see the elder and told him what had happened. The elder replied, Now that you have had the experience of silence and prayer of the mind, and have tasted the sweetness that this brings, you must always keep this in your heart, whether you are eating or drinking, having a conversation with someone, traveling, or sitting in your cell. With attentive thought and an undistracted mind, don't stop repeating that prayer, psalmodizing, and learning from the prayers and the psalms. Even when attending to your most pressing needs, don't let your mind remain empty, but exert it to study and to pray in secret. In this manner, you will understand the profound meaning of Holy Scripture and the power that is hidden there. You will teach your mind to pray unceasingly and will thus fulfill the words of the Apostle that command us to pray without ceasing. Diligently practice watchfulness over yourself and guard your heart against accepting any evil, vain, or futile thoughts, but let your heart, in secret, 
alternate learning from the Psalms and praying, Lord, Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Do this always, when you sleep and when you awaken, when you are eating, drinking, or having a conversation. Then, when you chant the Psalms with your mouth, be careful that you don't the only mouth the words while your mind wanders elsewhere. 11. The brother then said, I have many vain dreams while I sleep. The elder said to him, Don't be lazy or afraid. Instead, before falling asleep, recite many prayers in your heart. Resist thoughts and the devil's attempts to get you to do what he wants, and God will defend you. Do all you can to try to fall asleep with the Psalms on your lips and your mind reflecting on what you have learned. Never let your mind become careless by accepting extraneous alien thoughts, but go to bed with the same thoughts that accompanied your prayers, and let your mind reflect on them, so that they may remain with you while you sleep and converse with you when you awaken. Likewise, before you fall asleep, recite the creed of the Orthodox faith, for professing a true and correct faith in God is both the source and the safeguard of all blessings. 12. Teach me so that I, too, can be saved. He replied, Why are you so curious to know this? The brother got up, embraced, and kissed the saint's feet, and pleaded with him to tell him. After a considerable time, the elder said, You are not yet able to endure doing this, to exercise each of the senses in a way that is proper to its functioning is appropriate for a strong man who has experience in living with the blessings of spiritual truth and reality. It is impossible for the one who is not yet completely free of vain, worldly thoughts to be worthy of being granted this gift. Therefore, if you truly desire this, preserve in a pure heart the secret knowledge you have acquired. For if you achieve a state of unceasing prayer and learning from the scriptures, the eyes of your soul will be opened, and it will be filled with great joy and a certain inexpressible burning feeling accompanied by a warm sensation, even in the body that is generated by the spirit, so that the entire man becomes spiritual. And so, should God grant you either by day or night to pray undistracted with a pure mind, Set aside your rule of prayer, and with all your strength make an effort to reach out and cling to God, and he will illumine your heart in a way of the spiritual life that you have embarked on. He then added, An elder once came to me, and when I asked him about the spiritual state of his mind, he said, I spent two years praying before God and diligently imploring him with all heart, that he would grant me the gift of imprinting in my heart the unceasing and undistracted prayer that he gave to his disciples. And the exceedingly generous Lord saw my labors and my patience and granted me my wish. And this is what else he told him. Thoughts of vain things that occur in the soul constitutes the sickness of an idle soul that has become mired in negligence. This is why scripture teaches us that we must carefully guard our minds, psalmodize intelligently and undistracted, and pray with a pure heart. And so, brother, God deserves that we show him our zeal, first through our efforts, our ascetic spiritual struggles and good works, and then through our love and unceasing prayer, and he will show us the path to salvation. After all, it is obvious that there is no path that can lead us up to heaven other than the complete renunciation of all evil, embracing all good, perfect love for God, and communion with Him in reverence and in truth, so that he who attains to this will rise up to join the heavenly choirs. However, he who desires to ascend on high must steadfastly put to death the members which are on earth. For when our soul delights in contemplating true bliss, it no longer returns to any passions incited by sinful pleasures. Instead, it renounces all bodily, sensual delights and receives the vision of God with pure and undefiled thoughts. And so, we must maintain strict watchfulness over ourselves. We must endure much physical exertion and purification of the soul to welcome God into our hearts. 
Then we must fulfill his divine commandments without sinning, so that through the grace of the Spirit instilled in us, he himself would teach us to keep his laws steadfastly, as his illuminating activity in our hearts emanates from him like the rays of the sun. We must work hard and suffer many trials in order to purify in ourselves the image in which we were originally created, as intelligent beings capable of receiving enlightenment and of attaining to the image and the likeness of God, and in order to keep our senses pure and undefiled by purging them in the fiery furnace of trials, so that we are elevated to the dignity of royal stature. God also created human nature, able to contemplate the unapproachable light and the exceeding glory, as well as the ranks of the angels of glory, the dominions, the powers, the principalities, the thrones. However, once you purify any of the virtues, be careful lest you think yourself greater than your brother for having done this, while he was careless about it, for this is the beginning of pride. When you are struggling with some passion, don't despair or be afraid, because its attack is relentless, but resolve to resist it. Then prostrate yourself before the face of God, and cry out with your whole heart, as did the prophet, Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me, for I am powerless against them. 23. Seeing your humility, he will swiftly send you his help. If you are traveling with a companion, don't take part in the empty conversation, but keep your mind busy with its usual spiritual exercises so that it keeps up this good habit, forgets about worldly pleasures, and does not leave the safe harbor of dispassion. After speaking to the brother about these and many other things, the elder let him go. 13. Still, after a short time, the brother returned and said, What should I do, father? When I practice my rule of prayer at night, I become so sleepy that I can't continue to pray attentively and to keep a long vigil, and I want to do some work to keep my hands busy while I psalmodize. To this the elder replied, When you are able to pray with attention, don't do any work with your hands. But when drowsiness overcomes you, struggle a bit with that thought and resist it, and then busy your hands with some work. Again the brother asked, Father, don't you get sleepy when you practice your own rule of prayer? The elder said, Not that easily. However, if the drowsiness persists and I feel its effects, I read the Gospels from the beginning, starting with John, while I contemplate God with the eye of my intellect, and the drowsiness instantly disappears. I handle thoughts in a similar way, specifically when one assails me. I quench it like a flame with my tears and it vanquishes. You are not able yet to resist thoughts in this manner. It is better for you to hold fast to your spiritual lessons and to recite zealously the daily cycle of prayers described by the Holy Fathers, such as the hours, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and vespers, as well as the night services. With all your strength, avoid doing anything only to please others and guard yourself against any animosity toward any of the brethren, lest this separates you from your God. Strive also to guard your mind against distractions, so that it can zealously meditate on your inner thoughts. When you are in church and plan to receive the communion of the holy mysteries of Christ, don't leave afterward until you have been filled with perfect peace. Find one place to stand in church and don't move from there until the dismissal. Inside yourself, reflect that you are in heaven with the holy angels and in the presence of God, preparing to receive him into your heart. Prepare yourself for this with fear and trembling, lest you end up unworthy to share in the communion of the heavenly host. After strengthening the brother in this manner and delivering him into the care of the Lord and his spirit of grace, the elder let him go. 14. In addition to this, a brother who lived with the elder related the following. Once when I was sitting with him, I asked him if he had ever been tempted with the revelment of the demons while he lived in solitary places. He replied, Forgive me, brother, but if God permitted you to more years old now and have suffered many temptations living in solitude in various isolated places, 
it would not help those who have not yet experienced the solitary life to hear about the bitter sting of what I have experienced and have endured from these demons. There was one rule I always followed while suffering those temptations. I placed all trust in God and made a vow to Him to renounce all else, and He swiftly rescued me from all calamities. For this reason, brother, I am no longer concerned about providing for my needs. Instead, I easily endure the temptations that beset me, because I know that He will provide for me. The only thing I can offer Him from myself is unceasing prayer. And, in all this, it is no little thing to trust that the more sorrow and misfortunes befall you, the more they contribute to weaving a crown of glory for the one who suffers, for the righteous judge equally balances one against the other. Knowing this, brother, don't give in to faint-heartedness. If you have stepped into the arena to fight, then fight, and be encouraged by the knowledge that those who fight on our side against the enemies of God far outnumber the enemy hordes. For that matter, how could we even dare to stand up to such a terrible enemy of the human race if the mighty hand of God the Lord did not embrace, guard, and shield us? How would human nature endure the abuse of evil? For, as Job says, who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? Who can come between them? Out of his mouth come fiery torches, Sparks of fire shoot out, his nostrils belch smoke, as from a boiling cauldron. His breath kindles coals and issues from his mouth like a flame. Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. His heart is as hard as stone, unyielding as a milestone. He churns the depths into a seething cauldron. He makes the sea fume like a scent burner. He leaves a glittering wake behind him. He looks the haughtiest in the eye. Of all the sons of pride, he is the king. 24. This is who we are up against, brother. These are the words used to describe this tyrant. Yet those who live the solitary life as it should be lived easily achieve victory over him because there is nothing of his evil inside them, because they have renounced the world, because they possess superior virtue, and because we have one who fights on our behalf. For tell me this. Whose nature has not been transformed by turning to the Lord, and by granting holy fear of him in his mind, and by illuminating himself with divine laws and works? What man has not clad his soul in light, and enabled it to radiate divine wisdom and thoughts? That man will never let his soul be empty, for he has God within himself, who rouses the mind to reach out insatiably toward the light." and the Spirit will not permit a soul in such a state of unceasing spiritual activity to waver under the influence of passions. But, with royal authority and terrible wrath, he will turn on them, and, forbidding them to trespass, he then will mercilessly flog them. A man in such a spiritual state will never turn back, but, through practicing the virtues and praying in his mind with hands uplifted to heaven, he will be victorious in battle. 15. The same brother related that among other virtues, Abba Philman also had the following one. He could not abide by listening to empty words. If anyone unwittingly discussed something that was not spiritually profitable, he did not respond at all. Likewise, when I went out, he did not ask why I was leaving, and when I returned, he did not ask where I had been or what I from there. I went to Constantinople on some church matter, without informing the elder, this servant of God. After being away considerable time and visiting the devout local brethren, I finally returned to the hermitage. The elder was filled with joy to see me. He welcomed me in his customary manner, said a prayer, and sat down. Yet he did not ask anything, but simply continued with his usual spiritual exercises. 16. Once I wanted to test him, so for several days I did not bring him any bread to eat. He neither asked for this bread nor said anything about this. I then bowed to him and asked, Be so kind, Father, tell me, were you offended because I didn't bring you bread to eat as usual? He replied, Forgive me, brother, if you were to deprive me of bread for twenty days, I would not ask you for it. For as long as my soul endures, so will my body endure as well. 
That's how profoundly he was absorbed in the mystical contemplation of true spiritual realities. 17. He used to say, from the time I came to the hermitage, I never allowed my thoughts to wander outside the confines of my cell. I never permitted any thoughts to enter my mind other than those about the fear of God and the judgment in the next life. I never forgot about the final judgment that awaits sinners, the eternal fire and the darkness of hell, about how the souls of the sinners and the righteous live, about the blessings that await the righteous and how each man is rewarded according to his deeds, one for a life of valiant spiritual asceticism, another for honest mercy and love, yet another for generosity and a life of silent solitude, still another for extreme obedience or living the life of a wanderer. In reflecting on all this, I don't allow myself to entertain any other thoughts, and I can no longer be with people or think about them, lest I distance myself from reflecting on the divine. 18. He added to this a story about a certain solitary ascetic who had achieved dispassion and was receiving the bread he ate from the very hands of an angel. Yet he became lazy and attentive and was deprived of that honor. For when the soul relaxes its scrutiny and intense watchfulness, the night descends upon it. Where God does not shine, everything becomes murky as in darkness, and then the soul can no longer contemplate the one and only God or tremble at his words. Am I God when I am near at hand, says the Lord, and not God when far away? Can a man hide in secret places without my seeing? Do I not fill heaven and earth? 25. He also remembered many others who had suffered a similar fate. He gave the example of Solomon, who had lost his fame for a petty, lustful pleasure, saying that he had been granted wisdom that brought him fame and renown, because he illumined everyone with the light of his wisdom as dawn lights up a morning sky. Thus, it is dangerous to indulge laziness. Instead, we must pray unceasingly, so that no encroaching thought draws us away from God and replaces him in our mind with something else. Only a pure heart, which has become the abode of the Holy Spirit, can clearly see within itself, as in a mirror, the very God of all creation. 19. After hearing this and seeing how he struggles, said the brother who lived with Abba Philman, I understand that the passions of the flesh had completely ceased to act in him, and that he zealously loved all perfection, so that he always appeared transfigured by the divine spirit, from glory to glory, and was sighing inexpressible sighs, that he was focused within himself, communing with himself, and checking himself, and obscuring its purity or allowing the slightest filth to attach itself secretly to him. Seeing this, said the brother, I was filled with a zeal to live the same kind of spiritual life, and I earnestly beseeched him, asking, How can I attain the purity of mind that you have? He replied, Work hard, for this requires much effort and suffering of the heart. Spiritual blessings, which deserve hard work and to be zealously sought after, will not come to us if we lounge in bed and sleep. He who wants to succeed in the spiritual life must, first of all, renounce all his desires. He must acquire constant tears and must covet nothing. He must ignore the sins of others, focus only on his own, and shed endless tears over them day and night. And he must avoid all vain relationships with people, for the soul that grieves over its own wretched state and that is wounded by memories of its own transgressions dies to the world just as the world is dead to it. In other words, no longer are the passions of the flesh active in such a man, and no longer is he under their influence. Moreover, he who has renounced the world, who has united himself to Christ, and who lives in solitary silence, loves God. He preserves the image of God within himself and is enriched by this likeness, for he will receive the gift of the Spirit from him on high, and will become a home for God, and not for demons, and he will offer up his works of righteousness to God. Thus the soul that begins to live a pure life that is free of all defilement of the flesh, uncorrupted and without sin, 
will finally be crowned with the crown of truth and will radiate the beauty of the virtues. If, at the outset of embarking on a life of asceticism, a person's heart is not filled with sorrow, and he does not shed true tears of contrition, if the thought of eternal torments is not imprinted in his memory, if he does not persevere in true silence, unceasing prayer, psalmodizing, and studying divine scripture, if this rule has not become a habit resulting from constant practice, which would compel his mind to adhere to that practice even against his will, and if the fear of God does not reign sovereign in his soul, this person still has close ties to this world and can't pray with a pure mind. For only devout reverence and the fear of God purify a soul from passions, and by liberating the intellect, they bring it to its most natural activity of contemplation, and thus allow it to partake of the knowledge of God, which it receives in the form of a blessing. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. For him who has been granted this, it will henceforth serve as a pledge of what is to come, and will preserve his inner spiritual state as unshakable. Therefore, with all our strength, let us earnestly strive to practice the rule of living the spiritual life, virtues and ascetic spiritual struggles, which elevates us to a state of devout reverence that is the purity of the mind, and the fruit of this is theological contemplation, which is natural to the intellect. For the practice of this rule is the very ascent toward contemplation, as the perceptive and most divinely illumined intellect of Gregory the Theologian states. Therefore, if we neglect to practice the rule of spiritual life, we become strangers to the love of wisdom. For anyone who attains to the summit of perfection in the virtues will still need to labor assiduously in the ascetic spiritual life, which curbs the unseemly inclinations of the flesh, and to maintain meticulous watchfulness over his thoughts. And even with this, we are just barely able, by force, to take possession of Christ's indwelling in our hearts. For the more righteous we become, the more spiritually mature and strong, until finally the mind attains perfection, and it undividedly clings to God and is illumined by the divine light, which reveals to it ineffable and the faculty for truly knowing all things, where length of years and life itself reside, and where resides the light of the eyes and peace. For as long as one still struggles with the passions, he can't enjoy these delights, since both the virtues and the vices blind the mind. The latter prevents it from seeing the virtues, the former from seeing the vices. But when one finds peace from spiritual warfare and is granted the gifts of the Spirit, he will be under the constant influence of grace, transfigured by the light, and will attain a state of unwavering contemplation of spiritual realities. Such a person is no longer bound to anything of this world, but has passed from death into life. The person who undertakes to follow the excellence of such a life and zealously desires to draw closer to God must have a pure heart and pure lips, so that the pure words that emanate from his pure lips will glorify God in a worthy manner. For the soul that clings to God enjoys constant converse with him. And so, brothers, let us embrace a desire to attain such perfection in virtue, and let us sever our worldly bonds of clinging to the passions. He who struggles and has attained intimacy with God, who has shared in his holy light and has been wounded by love for him, it is he who rejoices in a certain unattainable spiritual delight in the Lord, as the divine psalm states, Delight also in the Lord, and he will give you what your heart desires. He will make your righteousness clear as the light, and your integrity as bright as noon. 26. And what loves is so powerful and so irresistible as the one that God pours into a soul that has been purified of all evil? Such a soul speaks from a true and pure state when it says, For I am lovesick. 27. Inexpressible and inexplicable is the brilliant splendor of divine beauty. Our words can't describe it. Our ears can't contain the sound of it. The light of day, the shining of the moon, the radiance of the sun, all these are insignificant in comparison with that glory, and they are more diminished in the presence of that true light 
than is the darkest night of the densest fog in the face of the brightest sun at noon. Marvelous among the teachers, Basil taught us this, having learned it from his own personal experience. 20. The brother who lived with the Abba related this and much more. Yet who would not marvel also at the following proof of the Abba's great humility? Although he had long, long ago been ordained as a priest and had with such profound sincerity attained heaven both in his life and with his intellect, he still avoided officiating at liturgical services, for he viewed this as a burden, so that during the many years of living the ascetic spiritual life, not only did he rarely agree to approach the altar to officiate at the liturgy as a priest, but despite the life of constant vigilance that he lived, he also refrained from receiving the communion of the holy mysteries if, at the time, he happened to meet and to speak with people, even though he spoke of nothing worldly, but only what was spiritually beneficial to those who sought to speak with him. But when he did intend to receive the communion of the holy mysteries, he spent a long time persistently entreating God and imploring his good will through prayers, psalmody, and confessions. He experienced fear and awe on hearing the priest pronounce the words, The holy things are for the holy. For he would say that at this moment the entire church was filled with holy angels, and that the king himself mystically officiated at the liturgy, and made the bread and the wine his body and his blood, and that through our receiving holy communion, he entered and made his dwelling in our hearts. He would add that it is, for this reason, that of Christ only in purity and chastedness, as if free from the bonds of the flesh, so to speak, and without any doubts or hesitation, so that we would participate in the illumination bestowed by these mysteries. Many of the Holy Fathers saw holy angels who guarded them from every harm, which is why they remained in a state of profound silence and spoke with no one. 21. And here is yet something else which that same brother related, when the elder himself had to go out to sell what he had made with his hands. He would stand silently and pretend to be mentally handicapped, so as to avoid any lies or swearing or unnecessary words or any other sinful acts that would occur if he had to engage in conversation and bargaining. Anyone who wanted to buy his wares would simply take them and pay him whatever they wanted. This great man, who so loved wisdom, wove small baskets, and he gratefully accepted whatever he was given for them and never said a word. A Summary of the Teachings of the Fathers In conclusion, we would like to offer a summary of the teachings of the fathers presented in this book. This is what the fathers teach us about how to pray and the conditions for effective prayer. Constancy The frequent and regular repetition of the Christ prayer. Attention, concentrating the mind on Christ while resisting all other thoughts. Variations in praying, reciting the Christ prayer either in its entirety or in abbreviated form. Sequences in a rule of prayer, praying, psalmodizing, sitting, standing with uplifted arms, again praying the Christ prayer, reading the works of the fathers after a meal, walking in the presence of God a state of always perceiving the presence of God and perceiving a constant remembrance of God, no matter what activity is being performed. Renunciation of the world, while remembering and reflecting on death and on the sweetness of prayer. Unceasing invocation of the name of Christ, to be done always and at all times, out loud if you are alone, only with your mind if you are among people. Falling asleep, in bed, while praying the Christ prayer, formal prayers, supplications to attain interior prayer, that is, asking the Lord for his help in zealously and sincerely praying the interior prayer of the heart. Therefore, you, O soul, who desires to attain the interior prayer of the sweet converse with Christ, approach, make your resolve, and fulfill the teachings of the Holy Fathers in the following manner. 1. Sit down, or, better yet, stand in a dimly lit and quiet corner in a prayful position. 2. First do a few prostrations, controlling the movement of your arms and legs. 3. Using your imagination, 
locate the place of the heart under your left nipple and focus your attention on that place. 4. Draw your mind down from your head into the heart and repeat, Lord Christ, have mercy on me. Do this quietly with your lips or only in your mind, whichever is more convenient. Pronounce the words slowly and with reverential fear. 5. At the same time, as much as you can, guard your attention and don't allow any thoughts to enter your mind, either bad or good. 6. Be calm and patient and determined to do this for a long time, forgetting everything else. 7. Use moderation in trying to be still and kneel as often as your strength permits. 8. Be silent. 9. After dinner, read something from the Gospels and from those works of the Fathers that discuss the practice of the interior spiritual life and prayer. 10. Sleep five or six hours a day. 11. Every now and then, verify the progress of your interior prayer by reciting formal prayers. 12. Don't do any kind of work that will distract you. 13. Check your experiences frequently against the instructions of the fathers. The holy prophet David exclaimed, Lord, strengthen my resolve, so you, my soul, must cry out too. Lord, grant me firm resolve in my intention to be watchful, for both the intention and the doing are from you. After purifying my mind and heart through watchfulness, and with your help and your support, may I prepare them as a home for you, the triune God.